Has it ever occurred to you that we still haven't found aliens, not because they're fiction, but because they move around too fast? Even Earth-based objects can become invisible to the human eye if they dash at breakneck speed. What do you expect from super-fast super-civilizations? Professor Robin Hansen believes that if extraterrestrial forms of life have mastered the skill of moving at the speed of light, we won't be able to detect them until they get down to Earth. It turns out that to find aliens, we need to catch up with them in development as soon as possible. But will we be able to do that? In this video, you'll find out, should we be afraid of cyborgs? Can aliens invade Earth? And most importantly, why should humans hurry up with moving up the Kardashev scale? First of all, let's see what the Kardashev scale is. In 1964, one Soviet scientist named Nikolai Kardashev devised a special scale, and that's exactly what will help us determine how developed another life form is. According to this scale, the level of progress that a civilization reaches depends upon the amount of energy it consumes and can produce. That's because the more advanced a society becomes, the more energy an average individual needs. This is well illustrated by the history of humankind. In the period from 1800 to 2015, Earth's population increased sevenfold. At the same time, total energy consumption grew 25-fold. But how is it possible to quench such a raging thirst if the world's resources aren't endless? That's right, the solution is to invent more alternative methods to generate renewable energy. The original Kardashev scale included just three levels. A Type 1 civilization should be able to extract the maximum amount of energy produced by its own planet and wisely use all the energy coming from the nearest star. For this kind of society, natural phenomena like, for example, tsunamis and earthquakes are not terrible disasters, but rather another way to receive additional energy. At present, around 65% of all the planet's energy is still obtained through conventional methods. I mean, by using coal, crude oil, and natural gas. Do you see how far we are from becoming a Type 1 civilization? However, advanced technology isn't the only feature typical for such a progressive society. In 1973, American astronomer Carl Sagan concluded that the basic qualities of a Type 1 civilization are absolute globalism and guaranteed easy access to all existing knowledge. Moreover, there should be a fully global economy with free markets where all individuals can trade with whomever they want without governments meddling in their activities. A planet where all countries are democracies promoting freedom of speech. Fortunately, if a civilization of this type appeared in our galaxy, people would be able to detect it at the end of the day. Modern telescopes are already equipped with devices meant to see techno-signatures, any observable manifestations of other life forms and their evolution. Although, even if we found them, it's hard to say whether they'd turn out to be peaceful neighbors or not. Being much more developed than humans, they could easily enslave us. But it's even scary to imagine what other more supreme beings have in store for us. Kardashev's classification suggests that a Type 2 civilization would be totally free from political conflicts and economic crises. This means that it would be able to direct all its efforts towards the exploration of new territories. This form of life knows how to use not only its own planet's energy, but also that of the nearest star. Moreover, it doesn't only convert the light, but has complete control over the celestial body. The most popular theory on how this can be put into practice is purely hypothetical and named a Dyson Sphere. This is a structure that would encompass every centimeter of the star. The sphere would capture most of its power and then transfer it to the planet for further use. Why does any form of life need so much energy? for survival. For instance, if people live long enough to become a Type 2 civilization, 
And if Earth is at risk of colliding with another object the size of the Moon, we may have a chance to simply evaporate it. If there were a Type II civilization in our galaxy, humans most likely would also notice it, as it's hard to miss a huge Dyson sphere encircling one of the known stars. According to Kardashev, this kind of society is nearly almighty. The only thing that can beat it is a Type III civilization. Its level of development involves using energy of the entire galaxy. In this case, such life forms can use the potential of black holes or even create new stars. Of course, modern day people struggle to imagine how exactly these plans can be brought to life. Because otherwise, we would have already moved up the Kardashev rating long ago. However, some authors like Paul Ratner assume that a Type III civilization would create numerous colonies of robots or other handmade organisms with artificial intelligence. They would spread all around the galaxy and colonize one star after another. They would build hundreds of Dyson spheres and set up a massive network that would carry the energy back to their home planet. Right now, we obviously can't see anything like that, and I have two possible explanations here. There's no civilization that's managed to reach Type 3 status yet. Or these creatures develop so fast and cover every trace of themselves so skillfully that the moment we do finally detect them, it'll be too late. But can some other civilization be even more advanced than that? And where will this lead us? In his original scale, Nikolai Kardashev introduced three levels, as he believed that the energy of the whole galaxy could cover any life form's needs. Some other scientists and sci-fi writers went much further, though. Let's not forget that our universe has not just one, but billions of galaxies, meaning that a Type IV civilization could control the energy of each of them. If necessary, these ultimate creatures could rearrange the galaxies, assemble new planetary systems like construction sets, or vice versa, permanently erase something redundant from the world. To do that, such a civilization would need to discover new laws of physics that humankind has no idea about and find a few dozen alternative energy sources. It shouldn't be too challenging of a task for organisms so exceptionally evolved. However, there's also the downside if we look at things from the perspective of ordinary people. Most probably, much of the planet would be inhabited by cyborgs, while descendants of humans would become one of the subspecies of the highly developed society. No worries. Given the global democracy, Homo sapiens shouldn't have any misunderstandings with cyborgs let alone wars. Although, there's a good chance that people would be regarded as a weaker and more vulnerable segment of the population, and thus, we'd definitely be denied the opportunity to participate in sports competitions or long space missions. But wait, that's not all. A Type V civilization could use not only the energy produced by our own universe, but also that of all the other dimensions existing side by side. If the multiverse theory is correct, it's possible to extract infinite energy from an endless number of parallel worlds. You think this is something unbelievable, right? But what if I tell you about a Type VI civilization where the super mind knows how to move faster than the speed of light? This would let it command all of space and time. This life form wouldn't find it difficult to go back in time and slightly modify the universe's formation by adding a few extra worlds, for example. Do you think we've reached the absolute limit now? Nope. The last type. Type 7, which is also called an Omega Civilization, could achieve true immortality. Members of that society could use virtual technology to travel to various pocket dimensions. To succeed in this, it's necessary to curve space-time so that it acquires a certain emptiness that will later be used as a new home for objects relocated from the already existing universe. Considering all the distortions, the laws of physics can be somewhat different there, which may be very helpful. 
For example, it could be potentially possible to program every single atom of every single individual in that dimension. The civilization could continue living in the pocket universe and then, when it fades away, move to a pocket universe inside the pocket universe, and so on indefinitely. How do you feel? Do you have a headache after trying to imagine all this? Don't worry, we aren't going to study complex technologies like that anytime soon. Because to reach this level of development, humankind may need 10 duodecillion years. If so, why do we even bother about this? The thing is that if we people don't start evolving faster right now, then we can simply never become a type 1 civilization. What type do people belong to in the first place? At the moment, our level of development is estimated to be around 0.75. Don't rush to rejoice, though. It doesn't mean we've covered 75% of the way leading to the much-desired Type 1 civilization status. Keep in mind that the Kardashev scale is logarithmic. So, leaving even one division behind requires producing more and more energy. If we try to translate the scale into linear density, we'll see that right now we have only 0.19% of the energy that a Type 1 civilization is supposed to create. To climb just one hundredth of the Kardashev scale to, let's say, 0.76, we should start producing 26% more energy than we do now. You may think, why should we worry about the pace of our development at all? I'll tell you why. Even if we don't care, someone else might. Up to now, NASA has already found about 4,000 exoplanets whose conditions can be potentially suitable for the emergence of life. Since we keep searching for interstellar neighbors and have never seen them yet, how can we know how advanced they actually are? Remember Robin Hansen, the scientist? He assumes that it's totally ridiculous to claim that we're unique to our vast universe. We're not only unable to see what's going on in its distant corners, but also joined the game much later, considering that the majority of exoplanets appeared way earlier than Earth. The researcher is adamant that if we don't hurry up the Kardashev scale, we'll simply have nowhere to live soon. That's because the faster a civilization evolves, the more room it needs. Imagine that all these spheres are different forms of life. The speedier their development is, the fewer chances to survive are left for those who haven't become a Type 1 civilization yet. And this rule works even if the universe is boundless. That's because an Omega civilization would be able to spread endlessly far away and with infinite speed. In your opinion, would members of this society leave us be if they ran into us in outer space? Or would they rather try to exploit the human race to produce even larger amounts of energy? That's why it's important not only to avoid aliens, but also to outdo them in space exploration. What's stopping us? The possibility of falling victim to the so-called Great Filter. Robin Hansen coined the term in 1996. According to his assumptions, the faster one or another form of life evolves, the harder time it's going to have. Even though we're extremely poorly developed compared to other potential civilizations, our society still matured pretty quickly on a cosmic scale. This has resulted in humans' ability to invent something really important, but left them practically careless of the consequences. Take at least polluting the environment with plastic. This means that instead of hypothetical space monsters, the human race is more likely to be destroyed by the human race. We're quite likely to bring ourselves to death with the help of our own discoveries. The most intriguing part is that, according to another futurist named Michio Kaku, the fate of humankind will be determined within some 100 years. What can we do to become a Type 1 civilization as soon as possible and not vanish into the interstellar meat grinder? To reach the seemingly unrealistic level of development, people need to take completely realistic steps. We should start with installing more and more solar batteries and wind turbines. That's simple. But what's next? 
For starters, we need to greatly improve all existing methods of energy production. In particular, this applies to nuclear power. Yes, this topic continues provoking a great deal of debate, as the memories of Chernobyl and the Fukushima tragedies are still fresh. That's why many progressive countries like, for instance, Italy, Germany and Belgium have decided to become nuclear energy free. However, from the standpoint of overall development, this is a step backward. After all, the more knowledge a civilization possesses, the fewer unforeseen problems it's likely to face. At this point, without nuclear power plants, we have zero chances to proceed up that scale. Indeed, we can try to find new alternative energy sources, but even these breakthroughs won't pave the way for becoming a Type 1 civilization. Humans will need something else. Remember what I told you at the beginning of the video. One of the main features underlying a Type 1 civilization is absolute equality of human rights and global democracy. Not our strongest suit, I guess. Right, we've already managed to create ultra-fast internet that lets users carry out their most ambitious plans without getting off the couch. But even now, about half of the world's population has no access to this essential tool. Absolute equality of rights, unlimited freedom, and economic transparency sound more like utopian fiction for the time being. But actually, this is precisely what should be our number one goal. Do you think we can handle all our problems before it's too late and occupy an extensive area of space before someone else does? Or are you more pessimistic and believe that we'll be destroyed shortly after we start, like in a video game?